hermetic call from out of the past. Stories, strange and weird. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Stories of the supernatural, the supernormal, dramatizing the fact, the mystery, the unknown. We tell you this frankly, so if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these magnets, play, play, we urge you, only, seriously, to turn off your way now. This is The Horror. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me this Saturday. We're going to hear from Theater 1030 this week, a production of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. It aired between 1968 and 1971. It was produced over various studios in Canada. Our story today is Dr. McGregor and the Case of the Curious Bone. Theater 1030 presents, from Vancouver, Dr. McGregor and the Case of the Curious Bone. A play by Betty Lambert. Oh, I knew it. One <clears throat> night out of ten, you're home on time. And it's after two tonight. You said supper at six, Mrs. No, Graydon. No, no use getting grumpy with me, Dr. McGregor. It won't do any good to your juices. Nine out of ten grumpy people don't digest their food properly. Is that so? There's in the magazine. Anyway, I was on an errand of mercy. That's why I'm late. Poor Miss Schofield. Yes, yeah, she's, uh, she's getting worse, I'm afraid. Oh, not all Miss Schofield. No. <laughs> oh, she's got nurses running after her day and night. Yes, and she makes them run, too, if I have an eye in my head. No, it's poor Miss Jenny I was thinking of. All alone in that big old house. Yes, you know, I've never been inside that house. Huh? Well, it's too big a place for two old ladies to handle. The whole west wing closed up. Everything's in a dreadful state with Miss Esther. The cupboards are disraced. And you looked in all the cupboards, of course. But I had to find a tea towel now, didn't I? Yes. I had to dry a week's dishes. <laughs> Strange business. I always wonder what happened to making so distrustful of people. Not a bad story. Huh? My old aunt, she was a girl at the time. She told me about it. Mm-hmm. Mm, yes, tragic, really. Mom. That's so. If some people think other people are nosy parkers, mm-hmm. just because they have to look in the cupboard for a tea towel, then some people shouldn't be nosy parkers themselves. Yes, well, it's all so long ago. I'm sure it's no consequence. Mm. They shut up the house right after it happened, just a year ago. Sent off the servants without a day's notice. Cut off all the sands. Well, they look like hermits. Well, if Jenny's not too well, I suppose I really ought to drop by sometime. <sighs> She's just getting on, you know. I, I don't think she needs a doctor. Nothing to see anyway. It's just a big old house. Mrs. Graydon, I am not interested in a Schofield house as such or in the local gossip. However, as Miss Esther Schofield's physician, I, I suppose I could be considered the family oh, doctor. Oh, yes. You haven't a curious bone in your body. <sighs> of course, the uh, Schofields are always odd. <laughs> oh, Mr. Schofield. Now, you wouldn't even trust the bank. He built a special room to keep his money in. Hmm? And those high walls, well, that was his doing. The sun never gets inside that house. It smells quite musty. I take it they were left waiting at the altar or something. Well, no one ever really knew which one he jilted, but as you say, it's, it's an old story. No one would be interested now. <laughs> but you know, it's really my duty to check up on Miss Jenny, huh? Make sure she's eating properly. Oh, sort of... yes. Doctors can go anywhere. That's just a professional interest. But anyone I else... I never is... said you were a nosy Parker, Mrs. Grady. If you're going, I'm going to. <sighs> Perhaps you're better. I'll probably never get inside by myself. She doesn't answer at first. You just have to keep right on. Miss Jenny? Miss Jenny, I know you're in there. She's got 
so deaf, you know, she can't hear a thing now. Miss Jenny, it's Mrs. Graydon. You remember me? I was here this afternoon. Yes, it's a lonely place. No houses for miles, not even a proper road. Those trees and the wall must keep the house in constant shadow. Miss Jenny! Oh, go away. We've just come to see how you are, Miss Jenny. I'll stick the dog on you. Now, Miss Jenny, you know there isn't a dog anymore. This is Dr. McGregor. Not me who needs the doctor. It's Esther who's sick. You the doctor who's taking care of Esther? Yes, I am. Going to die? Doing all that is humanly possible, Miss Jenny. Look at now. She's not the bad one she get inside. I know what you said. We'll only stay a minute, Miss Jenny. Tell that woman to stop shouting. It's training like a horse. So, you're Esther's doctor. I hear they cough up blood when they've got what she's got. Is that true? Miss Esther was resting satisfactorily this afternoon. Never could stand the sight of blood, Esther. Always squeamish. Miss Esther's in good hands with Dr. McGregor. There she goes again. I, I don't think there's any need, Mrs. Green. Think I don't know? People always shouting. I thought I might check you over, Miss Jenny. If you don't mind, perhaps I could listen to your heart. Nothing wrong with my heart. Yes, Esther always thought I'd be the first to go. Huh. Oh, breathe deeply, please. Good. Once again. Thank you. Well, I know what goes on. I saw you coming up the walk. I was here all the time. <laughs> Training like a horse. Who is that woman? Mrs. Graydon is my housekeeper. Don't mind me. I won't say a word. Oh, well, your heart seems very good. Any stomach trouble? Eat what I like. Down to the dollar. I uh, live to be a hundred. <laughs> I'll outlive her anyway. She thought she'd dance on my grave. Uh, now, they are. What for? Well, I, I want to take a look at your throat. Ah. Uh, hmm. Yes, yes, everything seems fine. Now, I'll just take your blood pressure if you'd like to roll up your sleeve. Oh, always jealous of me, you know. Plain as a turnip, Pastor. <laughs> uh, Miss Jenny, do you mind rolling up your sleeve? That's enough, young man. There's nothing wrong with me. Very well, Miss Jenny. I think I don't know what you came for. Nice bit of gossip, that's all you were here for. You'd like to know, wouldn't you? Well, I'll tell you this much. It wasn't her he wanted. I was the beauty. Look at these bones. You can still see it, can't you? I'm sure you were an extremely handsome woman, Miss Jenny. Now, if I could just wash my hands. Oh, it's up the stairs. I'll be right back. Where is he off to? The doctor just wants to wash his hands, Miss Jenny. He'll be right down. He was a bit like that, Dr. Chip. Who? Your young man. Ah, you'd like to know, wouldn't you? Never you mind. Yes, younger, of course. But for something quiet. He was too quiet. That's what he couldn't stand about Esther. Always talked your ear off, Esther. I used to watch him looking for light. Esther's mouth going a mile a minute. I just used to turn away. <laughs> that made her boil. What's he doing up there? Well, she was plain as a horse and not the front end either. <laughs> no. No. I was the one. I know things just as well as you or anybody. I'm sure you do, Miss Jenny. He's taking his time about it. <laughs> Maybe he's got love. Go up and get him. Go on. Oh, all right, Miss Jenny. There's no need to push. Could have washed his hands in the sink. Bunch of gossipy old snoop poking and prying. Dr. McGregor? Dr. McGregor? Dr. 
Dr. McGregor. Oh. It's just me. Oh. I must have taken the wrong turn. Oh, I should have warned you. That, that, that's the part of the house that shut up. Oh. The whole west wing. That's where old Mr. Schofield used to have his room. Well, I seem to be in a hall. But, but I tried the first switch I found. No light came on, so I realized I'd taken the wrong turn. Here, here just a minute while we're out here. Hold the door open a minute. Hmm? Yes, you, you can see down the hall in the light from the top of the stairs. Look at that dust. A wing can't be shut off, though. Oh, yes, it is. It's three years and years. But someone uses that room at the end. Well, look, you can see footprints in the dust. Never mind, they're up to the light switch, but the others go right up to that room at the end of the hall, the one with the iron door. That must have been his room. The father, you know, where he kept all his money. We'd better go down now, Doctor, or she'll have a fit. Yes. Hmm. I uh, wonder how recent they were. Uh, the, the footprint. Hard to tell in that light. your own sweet time about it. I'm sorry, Miss Virginia. I took the wrong turn and ended up in the West Wing. West Wing's all closed off now. Yes, I realize as much when I flipped the lights with you, no light came on. Light and heat shut off. Nobody uses that wing anymore. Nobody? We don't like people snooping around, trying to find out things. Yes. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to be going, Miss Jenny. I, I'll keep you informed about your sister. She always thought I'd go first. Oh, I'm sure you'll live to a ripe old age, Miss Jenny. Ripe old age, eh? Tell <laughs> that to Esther. <sighs> well. Odd? Odd. That's putting it mildly. Crackers, if you ask me. No, I mean, she said no one ever used that west wing, didn't she? Wait a minute. What? Look up there, Mrs. Graydon. Where? That light, uh, up there on the second floor. That's queer. That's in the west wing. Hmm. Must be coming from that room at the end of the hall. I flicked the switch in the hall just once. Must have been the switch for the room. Yes, I flicked it only once, so, so the light is obviously still on. But Miss, Miss Jenny said all the lights were off in the west wing. Yes, she did, didn't she? The Schofield must be an extremely cautious man. Why? See the bars on the window? Well, so they are. Someone broke the glass behind them, too. Oh, kids, probably. You know, shutting up a place like this just makes kids worse. That's why they used to keep the seat locked. <coughs> Trespassers will be prosecuted. <coughs> From out here, you can't see that window at all. No. Walls are too high. Mrs. Graydon, uh, what exactly was this this trouble you referred to? Uh, some man, I think you said. Well, uh, he came here on business. After all, Mr. Schofield died. Uh, Schofield had a mine up on the island, didn't he? Yes. And after, this, this young fellow came along to help the Schofield girls settle up business matters. Mm -hmm. He stayed here at the house. That was when they had servants. How long did he stay? Well, of course, it was before my time. I... I don't know personally, mm -hmm. but my old aunt says it was well, long enough to start people talking. Mm -hmm. You know how people gossip. You could see the Schofield girls were mad for him, all right. <laughs> well, they weren't exactly girls anymore, but and no one could tell which one it was he liked. Oh, he was courting one of them. He used to buy flowers down at Green's Market on Third Day and oh, yeah. take them up to the house. But one Sunday, he'd take Miss Jenny to church. The next Sunday, it would be Miss Esther. So I guess he was really just uh, playing both ends against the middle. <laughs> well, it must have been that because, because of what happened. Hmm? One day, he up and disappeared. And I shut up the house. That's men for you. What was his name, Jim? What was it now? Um, Foxton or Foxhall, something like that. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's really a curse to have a... Uh, what did you call it? A, a curious bone? Mm -hmm. uh, you find yourself making up stories about people, covering reality. 
something quite dull, with a rainbow of imagination. For instance, 50 years ago, when he was still young enough to hope, but old enough to be afraid, Schofield sisters welcomed into their home a young man. He was a bachelor, he was presentable, and they both fell in love with him. And he fell in love, too, with one of the sisters. There was Esther, who was practical, and Jenny, who was lovely. But men don't always fall in love with women who are lovely. A young man disappeared one day. Two women grow old in a house in which the sun never shines. Servants are sent away. Neighbors made unwelcome. Perhaps the young man didn't go away at all. Yes, if I were to give my imagination free reign, I would say that the young man never left the Schofield house. Oh, I suppose they've got him locked up in that room. None of the other upstairs room windows are broken. But you couldn't keep someone living in a room for 50 years. No. Not living. Really, Dr. McGregor. Oh, let us say the honorable young man. He decided to speak to the lady of his choice. But first, being an honorable young man, he informed the other sister of his intentions. Perhaps she loved him very much. Perhaps she felt she was the logical choice. Well, there's no fury, Mrs. Graydon. And so she asked him to go up to her father's room, say, to look over some papers, and there, when his back was turned, <laughs> yes, it's a good thing imagination doesn't influence reality. But, but how could she do it? She was, she was only a woman after all. A, a man did it so much no, stronger. No, Mrs. Great, it's just a story. Of course, it is the problem. How could she do it? And how could she do it without anyone knowing? Well, the servants were sent away, remember, without any notice. Perhaps the other sister found out and never said anything for fear of the scandal. It was just an exercise in fancy. So, Jenny did take a long time coming to the door. And then, there was a footprint in the dust. This is great, and your curious bone appears to be quite as macabre as my own. <laughs> There's probably a very reasonable explanation. But, she did say, I saw you coming up the walk. That window overlooks the front walk, doesn't it? Ah. Oh. Goodness, I, I've got shivers up my spine. Yes. I've one or two myself. Nothing serious, is it? I, I hate it when telegrams come. Mm. Look, I, I hope nothing's the matter. No. Oh, no, no, nothing's the matter. Well, his name was James Marshall Fox, and he never arrived back at the mine. You mean, you wrote and asked the Schofield mine about all that? James Marshall Fox, employed March 1908, December 1911, left employee of Schofield mine without explanation. He was sent here to get some business matters settled with the Schofield sisters. He completed his mission and then failed to report back at the mine. The manager wrote to the Schofield sisters, but they never answered his letter. He had no family, and no one bothered to make any further inquiries. But do you think it, it's really true? Do you think she killed him? Who? Oh, Miss Jenny. Why, Miss Jenny? What? Well, could have been Esther, too. Jenny must have been sick as a girl. She said Esther expected her to die first. Esther could have killed him more easily, being stronger. But uh, Miss Esther was squeamish. Miss, Miss Jenny said so herself. Couldn't stand the sight of blood. Oh, I can't see how Miss Jenny could have shut off the West Wing without Miss Esther knowing why. After all, Miss Esther always managed the house. Oh, but we mustn't judge Miss Jenny like this. We can't be sure she was the one who did it. No, I... and, and she did say she was the one he really loved. Yes, but uh, when a lady protests too much... <laughs> Hello? Yes, this is the great. When? Oh, I see. Yes, it can happen like that. It's a 
The blessing it was over so quickly, I suppose. Thank you, nurse. I'll, I'll be right down. That was the hospital. Miss Esther Schofield passed away five minutes ago. I saw you coming. Where's that woman? Uh, Mrs. Graydon isn't with me tonight, Miss Jenny. Good. You can come in. I don't mind you, young man. Uh, Miss Jenny, did you know the, uh, the light is still on upstairs? I, I noticed it as I came up the walk. What light? The one in your father's room in the west wing. All the lights in the west wing are off. You see. Uh, Miss Jenny, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. Now, sit down where I can see you. Yes. Thank you, Miss Jenny. Now, tell me, how is Esther? Miss Jenny, I said I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. So oh, she's dead, is she? It was very sudden. She didn't suffer. She didn't suffer? Are you sure? It was an easy passing. You don't fool me. Everybody suffers when they die. Did she know she was dying? Just for a moment, I think. The nurse said she asked for you. For me? Esther asked for me? She seemed to think you were ill. The nurse said she kept asking, where's Jenny? And then she said you were ill. She seemed to think you were in bed with pleurisy. Oh, Esther's dead. Hmm. Don't go for a minute, young man. You've got nice eyes. He has nice eyes, too. You loved him very much, didn't you, Miss Jenny? He loved me, too, no matter what Esther said. But Esther said he loved her. Was that it? You listen to me. He never took to Esther. I know the flowers were for me. But I was in bed when they came and she took the note off. That was when I had pleurisy. There's nothing wrong with me now. A woman can tell. Esther thought I was dumb. <laughs> that made any difference. He never cared for her. I was the beauty. Uh, after Mr. Fox went away, you closed up the West Wing, didn't you? And sent the servants away? I've got the flowers here. In that drawer. They were roses. You can't tell now what they were. I hid them from her. But you couldn't hide everything from Esther, could you, Miss Jenny? She had to know why the West Wing was closed up. I know they were for me. I know they were. Miss Jenny. Oh. Don't scare me like that, creeping up on me. Miss Jenny, haven't you heard a word I've been saying? Heard every word, every word. I can hear. I know what goes on. No. No, you can't hear anything when you don't look at me. I should have realized. How long have you been reading lips, Miss Jenny? I can hear, I tell you. There's nothing wrong with me. Of course. You've always been deaf. Even as a child... That was why you said people always shouted at you. You could tell they were shouting from the way the muscles in the throat strained. Just as you can tell when I'm speaking loudly. Or Mrs. Graydon. And that was your secret. That was what you didn't want anyone to find out. But he loved me in spite of that. He didn't care about me being deaf. He told me so. And that was all it was. Just that. That was why you shut up the house. Because you didn't want anyone to ever know. Oh, Miss Jenny. Do you know, I'm not a fool. Esther closed up the house. Hmm? It wasn't me. She said we had to. There wasn't any more money. And she sent the servants away, too. Esther? I was sick when it happened. 
so I didn't have anything to say about it. And when I got better, he, he'd gone. Miss Jenny. You've got nice eyes, young man. He had nice eyes, too. Why did he leave me? I... I don't think he wanted to, Miss Jenny. But he never said goodbye. He just went away. You'll come back and see me sometimes, won't you? I don't want the others. They always made fun of me and called me dummy. Yes, Miss Jenny. I'll come and visit with you as often as you like. Will you? I promise. What's your name, young man? Brian. Brian Duncan McGregor. This was James. James Marshall Fox. Miss Jenny, you were the one he loved. Was I? Truly? Truly. You were the one, Miss Jenny. No, all along it was Miss Esther. But even tonight, when I saw the light still on in that upstairs room, I, I couldn't understand what it meant. The light was still on? I don't see what you mean. She opened the door immediately tonight, and yet the light was on in that upstairs room. That means it must have been on since we were there the other night. Now, if Miss Jenny had known about the light in that room, remember I told you I'd flicked the switch in the hall only once? Mm -hmm. She would have made sure it was turned off that night after we left. No, Miss Jenny really believes that the West Wing is completely closed and that the lights have been turned off. But she took so long to open the door the other night. Don't you remember? She said she'd seen us coming up the walk. From a downstairs window as easy as from one upstairs. And she said we hadn't chosen to open the door at all. Of course, that should have told me immediately she was dead. In fact, that she'd seen us coming, not heard us knocking. I don't know how I missed it. You saw yourself. Sometimes she would answer a question directly. Other times, when she was looking away, she wouldn't seem to hear at all. I put it down to age. But I don't see why her being deaf should make any difference. Well, don't you understand it? Explains how it was done. It explains how one sister could kill him without the other sister knowing it. First of all, Miss Jenny was sick in bed with pleurisy. Secondly, she couldn't hear anything. I expect Miss Esther sent the servants away before she invited Mr. Fox up to her father's room. Footprints we saw in the hall were Miss Esther's. She must have visited the room regularly after the time she went into the hospital. The dust is filling them in now. But Miss Esther was always so squeezy. She couldn't stand the sight of blood. Or oh, she couldn't kill anyone. She didn't. She simply locked him in. That explains the broken glass from the window. Locked the door? But, but he would have screamed. Yes, he would have screamed. For days. Even for weeks. But who was there to hear? No one. Except, of course, Miss Esther. Do you... Do you think he's still up there? Yes, I had to go to trying to find out. There must be a key to the room somewhere in her. But I... I changed my mind. What good would it do now? The light in the room is out. I went up the hall and turned it off before I left. Someday we'll know, for certain. Until then, let's pretend it was all a story. Just the fancy of a curious bone. Dr. McGregor and the Case of the Curious Bone. A play by Betty Lambert. Ray Brown played the part of Mrs. Graydon. Roy Brinson was Dr. McGregor, and Barbara Tremaine, Jenny Schofield. Technical operation was by Jerry Stanley. Sound effects were by Bob Gray. The play was produced in Vancouver by the CBC and directed by Gerald Newman. This is Ray Nicole speaking. That's going to do it for this episode of The Horror. I hope you enjoyed our story this week. You can find more from Theater 1030 
past episodes of this show and thousands of other old-time radio episodes at relicradio.com. We've got our shoutcast stream up and running with even more old-time radio, and you can help support this and all of the shows at donate.relicradio.com or click on the donate link on the website. Your support makes it all possible. My thanks, as always, to those who have helped out. Thanks for joining me this week. I'll be back next Saturday with another episode of The Horror. presents tales of the strange and bizarre, the weird and the wicked. Stories not necessarily of the supernatural, but of the unnatural. Join us now for Strange Tales, featuring radio drama at its most mysterious and unusual. This is Strange Tales. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me this week. We're going to hear from Murder at Midnight this time. The series produced between September of 1946 and September of 1947, 52 episodes. Our story today was first heard April 26th, 1946. It's titled The Man Who Was Deaf. This is the place for it. Deep down under the city, under the earth. The concrete cold and damp as the stone of a mausoleum. The question is, which one of them shall it be? You, sir? You with the gray hair and the briefcase. Allow me to introduce myself. I am death. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Man Who Was Death. Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Robert Newman is The Man Who Was Death. It's late afternoon in the studio of Jan Roth, the sculptor. The rays of the setting sun come through the smoke-filmed glass of the skylight at an angle, casting long, dark shadows on the dusty floor. His face intense, Rolf stands before a more than life-size head of gray granite, cutting away some of the hard stone, then pausing to examine his work. It's still not right. I still haven't got it. And I don't know where I've gone wrong. The eyes, they would be brooding and half-closed. But shouldn't they be all-seeing? Let's try it. (laughs) 
Who's that? Who's there? It's Aline, Mr. Rawl. Aline Moffat. Aline? Oh, yes. Just a second. What is it, Aline? I told you I wouldn't be able to get here until late, Mr. Roth, that I was going to be modeling for Clayton in the early afternoon, but you said it didn't matter. Oh, yes, I forgot. If you don't need me, don't feel like working. No, no, it's, 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 uh, it's all right. Maybe it would help if I worked on something else for a change. Come on in. Something else? Oh, that, that head. Is that the first time you've seen it? Yes. You always kept it covered up before, It looks very powerful. Powerful, eh? Go on over to it, closer. Tell me who you think it is. All right. It's, well, it's a man. Pretty big man. A man. I knew it wasn't right. But if that's all you get out of it... Where, where, where's that mallet? Mr. Roth, what are you going to do? This, I'm going to smash it! Almost six months' work, but... There! You know what that was supposed to be? Death! Yes. For centuries, man has been haunted and obsessed by the fear of death. I was going to do something no artist has ever done before. Show mankind the face of death. Mr. Ralph, I, I don't think I feel like modeling this afternoon. You're I... frightened. Why? I don't know. The, the whole idea of... You too. What I wanted to show was the beauty, the peace that lies in death. Death's strength and inevitability and... Wait a minute. I'll phone you tomorrow, Mr. Ross. I said wait. It's it's beginning to come to me. What was wrong? To do a study, portray something, you've got to understand it. Inside and out. You, you've got to know how your subject thinks, feels, project yourself into it. To do a study of death, I've got to know all those things about him. I've got to become death. And that means... Mr. Ross, no. No, you can't. <laughs> But I can, Aline. I must. How can I understand death, become death, if I don't kill? Miss Craig? Yes, Nancy Craig. I'm Jordan, Harold Jordan of Homicide. I imagine you know why I asked you to come down here to the morgue. They, uh, they said it had something to do with my roommate, Aline Moffat. Is, is she... If you think you can take it, we'd like you to make the identification. I think I can. Ah, good girl. She's right here under the sheet. Ready? Yes. Oh, Aline. Uh, how did it happen? You know, I'll cover her up. Well, we traced the laundry mark. We're pretty sure we knew who she was. How did it happen? She was found in the river. But she was dead before she went in, strangled. Murdered? Oh, but why? By whom? Well, we don't know. We thought you might help us with that, too. Tell us what you know about her. There's not much to tell. She was a wonderful girl. Came from out of town, out west somewhere. Mm-hmm. She... You wouldn't know it from the way she looks now, but... She was beautiful. She used to do modeling. Any boyfriends? Oh, no one in particular. She went out with a lot of different men. Everyone liked her. That's why I can't understand. Who does she model for? A few photographers, but mostly painters and sculptors. Let me see. There was Jensen, Clayton, Rolf. As a matter of fact, I I think she was posing for both Clayton and Rolf. Better this time, much better. Things I can put into it that I never knew. Never felt before. Now, let's see. No! Still not right. Still something missing and... Not just a shade of expression, but something basic. One of the keys to the whole concept. But what? Haven't I played death's role, killed just as he does? Haven't I... Wait, that's it. Of course. Is that how death strikes, without thought, on the spur of the moment? No. He picks and chooses. 
decides just who shall die and who shall not. What's missing is the consciousness of power. The knowledge that there is no appeal from death. That he is the supreme authority. And that means that... Yes. I must kill again. And this time... Who? Who's that? Police department. Can we come in and talk to you for a minute? Why, oh, yes, of course. Just a second. Police. They don't know anything. They can't know. But I'd better cover this up. Mr. Rolfe? Yes. I'm Jordan of Homicide. This is Nancy Craig. Sorry to bother you at this time of night. No bother at all. Please come in. Thank you. I'm, uh... I'm investigating the murder of Miss Craig's roommate, Aline Moffat. Murder? You didn't know? Why, why, no. I never read the papers. And the last time I saw her, two or three days ago... Well, it happened just two days ago. Now, we've been checking back. We have an idea that you may have been one of the last people to see her alive. If there's anything I can do to help, anything at all... Could you tell us what happened when you did see her last? Of course. She was due here at three o'clock... But actually came at about five. Mm -hmm. She said another artist had delayed her. Uh, Clayton, that's right. I had already started working on something else, and since she looked so tired, I suggested we call the whole thing off. She seemed pretty happy about it. Left, and I'm afraid that's all I know. Uh, was there anyone else here? Anyone that actually saw her leave? I'm afraid not. You see, I'm the only tenant in the building who lives here, and I'm afraid everyone else... And gone by then. Hmm. Well, that sounds pretty straight to me. I guess that's that. Thanks very much, Mr. Rolfe. Not at all. I'm afraid I haven't been much help. But if you can think of anything I can do... Uh, we'll keep in touch with you. And uh, in the meantime, well, uh, maybe you should start reading the papers. Just every once in a while, huh? Right. I hope you read them too, my friend. Especially tomorrow's papers. Because I have a feeling that there just might be something in them that will interest you. Night. And a fine, small rain. Yes, this is how he would move. Walking slowly through the darkness... Searching, weighing, selecting his victim. I beg your pardon, what? sir. But could you tell me if that's the uptown subway over there? Why, why, yes. I believe it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not at all. Subway. What better place to make my choice than there? Deep under the earth. The concrete cold and damp as the stone of a mausoleum. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yes, this is it. This is the place. The tunnel dark as a yawning grave. The platform edge like the verge of infinity. And this is how he must feel. Studying. Selecting. Which one of you shall it be? You, madam, with the worn coat and the draggled hat. Why are you looking at me like that? Do you know what's in my mind? Don't be afraid. It won't be you. You, young man, with the books and the glasses. No. Then what about... Yes. Down there at the end of the platform, my friend has suggested this. My prosperous-looking friend with the gray hair and the briefcase. Don't look up at the track so impatiently. A train is coming. But so am I. Good evening. I beg your pardon, sir, but uh, I'm afraid... Oh, I didn't recognize you at first. Why, well, you're the chap... Directed but... you down here, yes. But I felt that you should know exactly who it was you spoke to. Allow me to introduce myself. I am dead. What? What do you mean? What are you what are you doing to me? Let go! Let go! Quietly, the man who 
as death steps back from the edge of the platform as the train grinds to a stop, a woman screams. And somewhere in the distance, a clock strikes twelve for... Murder! At midnight. Back to the story of The Man Who Was Death. It's late the next afternoon, and Jordan is alone in his bare cubbyhole in police headquarters when there is a knock on the door. Come. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Oh, hello, Nancy. You don't seem very happy to see me. I am, and I'm not. It's a nice change to have someone as pretty as you come down here. On the other hand... You haven't gotten anywhere with Aline's murder. No, no motive, no clue, no nothing. I'm afraid we're licked. But you can't be. You can't give up. I'm sorry, Nancy. I don't like it either. But, well, it happens sometimes. But you can't let it happen. Not in this case. Uh, You're you're pretty well wound up, aren't you? How about letting me take you out, buy you dinner? No. I I am upset, yes, but... What's the matter? Oh, maybe it's nerves. That trip down to the morgue, the whole atmosphere around the case, but... Would you think I was mad if I told you I... I felt that some horrible power was abroad? That death himself was stalking through the city? Mm -hmm. You and Mrs. Dolan. Mrs. Dolan? Who's she? Well, that accident in the subway last night. A guy who fell or jumped in front of a train. Didn't you read about it? No. Well, this Mrs. Dolan was one of the witnesses, and... She swears that just before it happened, she went all goose pimples, felt as if death was breathing down the back of her neck, and that she was going to die. It's true, Hal. I know it is. I mean, well, that's exactly how I felt. I can't remember just where or when, but sometime during these past few days, I I felt that I was in the same room with death myself. Hmm. Well, like you said, it's probably nerves. Strain you've been under. Just the same, it's kind of a funny coincidence. I think maybe I'll go see Mrs. Dolan, talk to her. Do you want to come? I I don't believe so, Hal. Somehow I feel we're awfully close to the answer. If I could just remember where and when it was I felt that way, that I was in death's presence. I think I'll go home. Okay, Nancy. I'll call you there after I talk to Mrs. Dolan, and, uh, well, maybe we'll find that we really have something. Just a little more off the cheekbones. Get the gaunt feeling of a skull under the flesh. No, no, it's still not right. Still something missing. But what is it this time? Didn't I stalk and select my victim? Didn't he recognize me for what I was? Death himself. And didn't... Wait. Of course. It's never just the victim alone who knows, fears, and fights against death. It's all of society, medicine, science, the police. All of man's resources from time immemorial lined up against death. And he still triumphs over them. That is the secret and the measure of his omnipotence. That is the last missing element. And that means that I must kill yet again. And this time, not just the victim, but the whole world must know it. And be powerless to stop me. This time. Who? Who's that? Who's there? Nancy Craig, Mr. Ross. I don't know if you remember me. Nancy? Oh, oh, yes. Just a second. I'm... I'm awfully sorry to be bothering you again, That's perfectly all right. Isn't Mr. Jordan with you? No, I... I came alone. I... Well, there was a little experiment I wanted to try. Oh, please come in. Thank you. Just what was this experiment? It, uh... Well, it was probably pretty silly, but I had to try it. Thinking back, I had a queer feeling that I... What? What's that? A bust. Something I'm working on. Something I hope will be my masterpiece. Do you like it? I'm afraid I... No. Oh, it's awful. It, it's terrible. It... it... 
It was here that I felt it. Here in the studio, and... And you... Yes, Nancy. It was I who killed a lean Muppet. And also a gray-haired gentleman with a briefcase in the subway last night. That... That piece in the paper, Mrs. Dolan... Exactly. You see, that bust over there is a study of death. And to do a study, you must project yourself inside your subject. That meant I had to become death. Oh. Where are you going? Out of here, you're mad. No good, Nancy, no good. I locked the door when you came in. Oh, but you can't. Well, you can't. Help! Help me! Help! Help! No good either. Oh. We're five stories up. And all the other tenants have gone. You came here at a very opportune time for me. I had just decided I needed one final victim. And I'm afraid that's going to be you. I'll never forget it, Mr. Jordan. It was pretty late, about 12 o'clock, and it was raining. There were only a couple of people on the subway platform, three or four, and I was standing by myself, not thinking about anything in particular, when suddenly this... This feeling came over me. Uh, what kind of a feeling? Oh, a feeling that, that this was the end. A feeling that death was standing there, right close behind me. I got so weak and shaky that I thought I was going to faint. I shut my eyes and leaned against one of the posts, and that's how it was that I, I didn't actually see the accident. Mm -hmm. Well, did you, did you turn around when you had that funny feeling? Did you notice whether there actually was anyone standing behind you? I did. There was just a young fellow with glasses and another man... Kind of strange looking, now that I think of it. Strange? How? He was about 35 or 40, pretty big. I guess it was his hair. He, he wasn't wearing any hat, and, well, he was almost white and very long and bushy. What? Did he have a thin face, uh, gaunt and uh, deep-set eyes? Why, why yes, I, I think he did have. Do you know him? I'm not sure. If I do, then I may know a lot of other things, too. Good Lord. Nancy. What? I, I've got to get out of here. Just a second, young fellow. Where do you think you're going? In there. No one's going to... Hanrahan. Oh, there you are, Jordan. Where the blazes have you been? What do you mean? What's going on? A devil of a business. A lunatic in the top floor studio there. He phoned headquarters, asked for you. Said that he had a girl there that he was going to murder. Said that he wanted us to know, even though there was nothing we could do to stop him. We thought it was a gag at first. Well, what are you doing about it? Everything that can be done. I've got men all around the building. Up in the roof, across the street, outside his door. Well, can't you break down the door? Sure, and finish her off quick. He said that if we tried it, he'd bash her brains out with that big hammer that he's working with. But there must be something, a Tommy gun from the roof across the street. He's got her right in front of him, so that if you got him, you'd get her too. I tell you, there's nothing, absolutely nothing anyone can do. You're wrong, Hanrahan. There's just one person, one thing that can stop him. What's that? Death. <laughs> You're getting impatient, my dear. Oh, why are you doing this? You know you can't get away with it. You know... Get away with it. You think I care that it matters to me whether I live or die when I finish this? I'll never be able to surpass this, but neither will anyone else. I know now how death must feel. And I've caught it forever for all men to see in stone. Yes, friend Rob. <sighs> you have. And you've made me very proud. What? Who's that? You don't know. Even though I've been on your mind for months now, even though you're just finishing my portrait... You? Where? Where are you? Where would I be? Everywhere. Outside in the hall. Down in the street. Here in the studio with you. Can, can you be seen? I, I must see you. I must. Very well. Walk this way. Over towards the door. A little further. A little further. All right, here. 
here I am, Ralph. Maybe I don't look the way you thought I would. Jordan! Yes. Now drop that mallet and get your hands up. It was you. And I thought... Get him up, I'm... Ralph, I said. I'm... I'm... Okay, you... if that's the way you want it. Help! Help! It's okay, baby. It's all over now. Oh. Have you loose in a minute. Jordan, are you all right? Yes, break the door down if you want to come in. I'm busy. Oh, you got him. But how? Uh, I, I talked to him through the vent pipe from up on the roof. I figured that if he was crazy enough to do all the things he did do, he might be crazy enough to believe death could pay him a visit. When I'd maneuvered him far enough away from Nancy here, I jumped through the skylight. Hell, and... hell, look. Good. Good Lord. What is it? That... That bust he was working on. He said it was a study of death. And in a way, I guess it is. Because it's a self-portrait. Two men and a girl, staring down at the body of the dead sculptor, lying next to his weird masterpiece. But is it possible that there is still someone else in the studio? An unseen presence that has been there since the clock first struck twelve for... Murder at Midnight. again when death walks through the darkened streets while the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Jan Rolfe was played by Frank Barrons. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leder. That's it for Strange Tales this week. You can find more from Murder at Midnight at RelicRadio.com alongside thousands of other old-time radio episodes, all the other podcasts, and everything else Relic Radio. If like to help out, visit Donate.RelicRadio.com or click on the Donate link. We've got some downloadable sets for certain donation amounts. Any amount is always appreciated. Thanks to those who have helped out. Thanks for joining me today. Be back next week with another episode of Relic Radio's Strange Tales. Strange Tales.